the forests of America. 641 million acres of trees. One third of our land covered with trees. Here too is the source of our wood pulp, enough to provide us all with a pound of paper apiece every day. From these forests come our newsprint, cardboard, and yes, even our rayon, for that too is a wood product. To supply this tremendous demand, we have to use a lot of trees, for paper is most easily and cheaply made from wood. Fortunately, we have a lot of trees. Better yet, we grow a lot of trees, for these forests grow new wood every year. So the ringing cry of timber, which echoes across the hills, is part of the endless cycle. The end result, use of the trees, which grow all over our land. These young trees, about three years old, are a new forest, naturally seeded and growing fast. They started first as tiny seedlings like these, less than three inches high. The seedlings grew up from small wing seeds scattered by the wind. During growth, these seeds were protected in cones like these, and the cones themselves grew from flowers produced by mature trees every spring. Thus is nature's endless cycle complete. But sometimes, where there are no seed trees, man must do nature's job of planting. The ground is opened with a special tool, the seedling is placed, and the earth is packed back around the young roots. In the west, on steep hillsides, a whole crew of men work slowly down the hill, planting young trees to clothe the naked earth. They stoop, break ground, place a seedling, pack the earth, then move on down the hill in rhythmical strides to plant another. A faster method is the tree planting machine, used where land is flat in the south and the lake states. These two men with one tractor can plant 10,000 tree seedlings a day in the moist, fertile earth. And here is a tiny growing seedling, source of paper. Seedlings grow fast. In the south, after eight years, they're this big. And after 23 years, they've formed a new forest. While they grow, silent fire towers stand guard over them, manned by men who know the ways of the forest, like this grizzled woodsman. They maintain watch over the timberlands, are quick to spot a smoke trace, telltale indication of a forest fire, and quick to report it. Such a fire report halts all other woods work and sends men to the fire scene on the double. Many machines fight fire, Discs plow fire breaks, turning the moist earth to stop the flames. Following the fire break, a backfire is set. Special two-man tractors carry their own tanks from which water can be sprayed over the burn. Constant vigilance and hard work keep fires small and protect trees. Patiently, these firefighters cover every inch of ground to make certain the fire is out. If trees are protected, they grow swiftly and soon the first harvest of the forest crop can be made. First, it must be determined which trees can be cut. This is done by a trained forester who marks the trees for cutting, usually with a paint gun. These foresters know the forest must renew itself, so they leave some vigorous healthy trees to grow and provide seed for new growth. Other trees are marked for harvest, many of them fire scarred, diseased or slow growing. After the forester has made his selection, he is followed by the next crew in the forest harvest, the fallers. Sometimes this felling is done by hand, but more and more machines are taking over this wood's work. In just the last few years, in fact, much logging has become highly mechanized. Various kinds of power saws, of which those shown here are only a few models, speed up the work of cutting. They make it possible to deliver logs to the mill at less cost which of course means wood products for the consumer at lower prices. Some trees which are cut have been scarred by disease and fire. Others have been tapped for turpentine, but they still can be made into useful wood pulp for paper. After felling, the trees are trimmed and bucked into suitable lengths for transport to the mill. Sometimes the bucking is done in the woods before the tree is moved. And here again, we see a portable power chainsaw cutting quickly through the tree. At other times or in other places, the whole tree length is moved out of the forest by a tractor and logging arch, which bring the tree to a central loading point. 
The tractor can then drop its load and go back for another. Here, a tree length is moved onto a set of rollers, which take it under a circular cutoff saw that quickly reduces it to the required lengths. These lengths are picked up as they come from the saw by an endless conveyor, which loads them aboard a truck for shipment to a rail siding. At the siding, these pulpwood logs are put on railroad cars and speeded by train to the mill. At the mill, the pulpwood is stored in log ponds or stacked in piles on the ground near the plant. Before going to the paper machines in the mill, pulp logs must be debarked. And here again, we see the great machines of this pulp and paper industry. In the West, these logs often are barked by powerful jets of water. As the logs turn underneath this nozzle, tremendous water pressure pounds off the bark. In other sections of the country, smaller logs cut into pulpwood lengths are often barked in a large drum. Here, these smaller logs tumble against each other as the drum turns, rubbing off their bark. As they come from the barking drum, the logs pass down a conveyor where defective pieces are removed. In some mills at this point, pulpwood is ground against great rough-faced grinding stones for the groundwood process. But here, in the chemical process, logs are cut up into tiny chips. These swift-moving chips are less than half an inch square and an eighth of an inch thick. By rapid, endless conveyor belt, they are carried to the top of the digester for chemical cooking. This cooking will separate from the chips the cellulose wood fiber from which paper is made. Chips are emptied into the digester through a hopper. When the digester is full, the hopper is taken away. The excess chips are blown off for a tight seal. And the heavy lid is lowered and bolted to the top of the cooking vat. The digester is really the stomach of the paper plant. After it is sealed, chemicals and steam are let in by these manual controls to cook the wood, separating the cellulose fibers so they can be used in making paper. An accurate and continuous check is kept of the transformation going on inside this digester, which operates, incidentally, much like the pressure cooker in your kitchen at home. Here is a diagram of the cooking done in the digester. Chips from the conveyor are fed in at the top. Then they drop to the second compartment where they are to be cooked. Chemicals and steam enter through another opening and the cooking begins. The cooked pulp will then go to the blow pit where it settles and then is taken off to make paper. You can actually see the wood fibers which make up this pulp if you wet and then tear a piece of newspaper. Along the torn edge, the thousands of tiny hairs which you can see are cellulose fibers from trees. Here is the result of the digester's work. This thick pulp is washed and then thinned to about 99% water. In this man's hand, you can see matted together thousands of the tiny fibers. These fibers are thoroughly separated and then fed to the paper machine. Here is a view of the whole length of the paper machine. In the foreground, at the right, is the wet end, and in the distance, the dry end. Here at the wet end, the thin layer of pulp is spread over a swiftly moving fine mesh wire, which vibrates to mat the fibers together. Much of the water drains off through the wire and over rollers underneath it. Soon dry enough to sustain its own weight, the mixture moves from the wet end of the machine to the dry end and becomes paper. At the dry end, it travels through this long series of steam-heated rolls called dryers, which remove more water. These sections may be only 20 feet long for lightweight stock like cigarette papers, or up to 350 feet long for some types of heavy wrapping paper. Sometimes the paper moves over these machines at speeds up to 22 miles an hour or 2,000 feet a minute. When a roll of finished paper is to be taken off, a jet of air starts a new roll. There it goes, without stopping the machine. After this, the old roll can be taken off the machine, rewound, cut to proper size, and sent to the consumer. This is a roll of paper finished for office work, but the basic process for making other pulp and paper products, or bags, wrapping paper, and book papers, would be much the same. Leaving the machine now, let's go with this man to the laboratory 
and look in on one of the most important phases of pulp and paper manufacture, research and testing. Throughout all this process, research plays a vital role. Here in the Plant Standards Laboratory, papers are tested mechanically to make certain they meet rigid quality requirements. This machine, for instance, tests the number of times a piece of paper can be folded. And here, paper is popped at the center with air pressure to test its bursting strength. And here, the paper is torn in a special machine which reveals its tearing strength. In addition to much mechanical testing, constant chemical research discovers new ways in which paper can be made better. Cellophane, for example. But behind all of this vast paper-making process is the tiny seedling. Carefully managed by firms of the pulp and paper industry, little seedlings grow up all over the country, becoming new trees, new forests, vast acres of timber, which is a tree farm crop because it grows again. And that new growth depends upon this tiny seedling and man's care of the seedling and the forest.